We begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, writing to the believers in the church at Corinth, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the word gospel, the good news, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein, that is in this gospel, in this good news, ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For Paul writes, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. This was not something that Paul just came up with. This was a message, this, this was good news that he personally received from God himself. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Why wouldn't everyone receive the most incredible news that they can have a personal relationship with the one true God who gave his only begotten son for him or her. Well, it's fascinating that earlier in this letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul actually describes the gospel or the good news as a stumbling block to the Jews and as foolishness to the Gentiles. Turn, if you will, back a few chapters to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. The apostle Paul writes, For the preaching of the cross, that is the authoritative proclamation of the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary, is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Move your eyes down to verse 23 where where Paul writes, But we preach, we authoritatively declare Christ crucified. The work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross for us. Notice, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. If you think through how the gospel is a stumbling block and foolishness, if you think And you wonder, how is it that good news, the good news is a stumbling block in foolishness. You will come to the conclusion that in either case, whether it's to the Jews, the stumbling block, or to the Greeks or to the Gentiles, foolishness. In either case, an unbelieving Jew or an unbelieving Gentile is offended by the simplicity of the gospel. And the fact that God himself was manifest in the flesh to take away the sin of the world. There is such a great tendency today in our culture and in the professing church to water down the gospel, the good news of the person and work of Jesus Christ in an effort to make it less offensive to mankind. To one degree... I can appreciate this desire not to offend. I'm not a person who wants to go around and try to intentionally be as offensive as possible to those with whom I come into contact. I can appreciate the desire not to offend. And I understand why some people are engaged in this attempt to, we might call it sugarcoat or or water down the gospel. To another degree, however, the attempt to water down or sugarcoat the gospel has serious ramifications and consequences. Some of which actually entail an alteration or an abomination of the very message of truth itself. This, of course, can lead to what we call a false gospel, which Paul describes in Galatians as no gospel at all, since it has no power to save anyone. At the other end of the spectrum are those who have the true gospel... They understand what it is to believe in nothing but the person and work of Jesus Christ for one's eternal well-being, but who present it in a way that deeply offends and is highly offensive. Their presentation actually stands as a barrier oftentimes to the listener. They, they sometimes, I've known people in my life who revel in their brashness, in their incivility, in their pseudo-boldness. 
I prefer personally, and for us at Grace Bible Church, to try a biblical approach to the proclamation of the gospel. One that recognizes the offensiveness of the gospel, yet the simultaneous need for us to share it in a non-offensive way as much as this is possible. I mean, we can use the analogy of a person. I just, it just happened the other day, noticing somebody uh, walking out of a bathroom with with toilet paper stuck to their shoe. You ever seen that? You're, you're, you're sitting somewhere. For me, it's usually in a Starbucks and, and you're, you're, you're sitting there and you see somebody walk out of the bathroom with a long trail of, of toilet paper sticking uh, to their shoe. There's, there's no way to share the truth with that person that it in some way doesn't offend them or is awkward for them, right? I mean, there's really no way, no way to do this. I mean, it's embarrassing. It makes the person look awkward. Yet we can share this information for the good of this person in one of two ways. We can yell it out brashly in front of everyone and make them look and feel stupid. You can holler across the room, hey, you've got toilet paper stuck to the bottom of your shoe. So everybody hears and the person runs out of the room in embarrassment. And we can try to, to do it this way and then rationalize and say, well, it, it's for their own good. Or we can carefully, carefully, and we can discreetly tell that person that something's wrong and you need to get it right. In Scripture, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul asks for prayer. He asks for prayer that he may declare the truth. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 4. He asks for prayer that he may declare the truth. Notice this phrase. As I ought to speak. As I ought to speak. Now, then Paul continues in Colossians chapter 4. And he tells us, the believers in Colossae and us today through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let your speech be always with grace. Seasoned with salt. Not a whole bunch of salt and a little bit of grace. Always with grace. Seasoned with salt, that she may know how ye ought to answer every man. That she may know how to answer every man. Jesus himself urged his disciples, remember, to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Today, with the time that we have, and we don't have a lot of time this morning, I want us to understand that the gospel message is indeed offensive. It's offensive. We cannot, and we, we must not, though, water it down or change it. Yet at the same time, we can share it in a manner that the Holy Spirit can use to convict the sinner rather than in a way that's a barrier to the cause of Jesus Christ. I want to consider this morning with the time we have the truth of an offensive gospel and then briefly consider how we can share it biblically and effectively. Why is it that no one would receive? Why isn't it that everyone would not receive the good news of the free gift of eternal life? through faith alone in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Number one, I propose to you this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the gospel is offensive because it tells us we are broken. The gospel is offensive because it tells us. Notice back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 how that Christ died, verse 3, for our sins. Sin is the original problem. Sin is the original problem. And while everyone in the world will admit that sin does exist in some form, most have a distorted view of sin. I mean, some say that, well, sin is outweighed by the good in my life. Oh, I sin. I, I've done some things I shouldn't have done. But, but really, the sins in my lives are outweighed by the positive or the good things that I do in my life. There are those today in the culture in which we live that say, well, sin is simply a, a low view of oneself. Sin is a, is a low self-esteem of yourself. It's not viewing your greatness and your value and your potentiality properly. 
Some say that, well, sin is ultimately committed just by the really bad people who steal and who murder and who commit adultery and and all of those things. Those are the sinners, the really bad ones. And as I measure my own self according to my standard of other people, I'm not that bad. And then there are those specifically in the, usually the intellectual camp today who say, well, sin is, it's just a human contrived concept that labels and categorizes man's behavior. What's the biblical view of sin? The gospel is offensive because it tells us we are broken. Christ died for our sin. The biblical view of sin reveals that every single person born into this world is sinful, broken, and separated from God. Every single person. No exceptions. And can I share with you that that's very offensive to the human mind? It's very offensive. But what does the Bible say? You go back to Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. The Bible declares very clearly in Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we better than they? Uh, uh, no, in no wise. We have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin, Paul says. Jews aren't better than the Gentiles. Gentiles aren't better than the Jews. Some don't have more or less sin than the other. We're all under sin. As it is written, verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, for all have sinned. Is there, any, is there an exception clause in verse 23 of Romans chapter 3? For, for all. Now, is there an exception clause in verse 9? You're either a Jew or a Gentile in this world. And, and, and all means all in verse 23. For all have sinned and come short and fallen short of the perfect standard of righteousness, the glory of God. We can go over to Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, and, and, and the Apostle Paul writes that when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. The ungodly. Verse 12, is one, by one man sin entered into the world, that is through Adam, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all for all. All have sinned. Here we are again. No exception clause. Verse 18 of chapter 5. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. The gospel is offensive because it tells us we are broken. Christ died for our sins. Every single person here this morning, every single person in the entire world ever born into this world fits into this category as one who is broken by sin. Nobody can say, well, no, I'm better than so-and-so, or, or this is just a social construct of the mind, or, or whatever it might be. No, no, the Bible says all are sinners and have sinned, and that's offensive to the human mind. Because I'm really not that bad. Compare me to some of you. Some of you compare yourselves to me. Compare yourselves to someone else out there, whatever it might be. The gospel is offensive because it tells us we're broken. And number two, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the gospel today is offensive because it tells us we cannot save ourselves. Christ Verse 3, died for our sins. The cry of the secular humanist in today's culture is this. We do not need anyone to save us. We can and we must save ourselves. The idea of Unable, inability, we are unable to save ourselves is totally offensive to the proud and self-sufficient yet self-deluded man or woman today. 
I mean, we all think we can do it. If we try hard enough, if we put enough effort and energy and focus and discipline, or if we throw enough money at it, or if we, whatever it might be, we can do it. I can fix myself. And yet the gospel, the God's, God's word makes it clear to us, we cannot save ourselves. That's so offensive to the human mind that I, you're telling me I can't do it. Have you heard somebody say, the minute you tell me I can't do something, you've just motivated me to get it done and I'll find a way to do it and it's going to happen. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 21 is very, very clear. For he, God, the father hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. He knew. Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, knew no sin. That, here's why he did this, we might be made the righteousness of God in or through him. You see, a just one needed to be a substitute for the unjust. One who is dead in sins cannot bring himself or herself spiritual life. I I can't do it. You can't do it. It is utterly physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually impossible. We can't do it. Romans 5, 6, again, makes it clear that we were without strength. It doesn't just mean, well, we we were a little bit weak. We were without. That means we were totally void of. We had zero strength to save ourselves. It was physically and spiritually impossible for us to give ourselves spiritual life and peace. The gospel is offensive because it tells us we're broken. It's offensive because it tells us we cannot save ourselves. And yet today, rather than be full of pride and offense because we cannot save ourselves, our response, our response, friends, should be that of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for providing a means of salvation so that I might know my eternity and in the here and now possess a relationship with the God who made me and loves me. I mean, I, I've used this illustration before that, you know, we don't find, we live here in the Central Valley and there are mountain range, I mean, all around us, beautiful mountains and people go hiking in the mountains all the time. And, and, and every once in a while you hear the sad story on the news of, of a missing person. They went out camping one night, lost their way. They're out there somewhere and and there are helicopters and search parties overhead. People are trying to find this lost person. Well, I have never in my life heard of a lost hiker being too proud to be saved when they're lost in the wilderness. What happens when, when rescuers come upon these lost, helpless hikers I mean, they are full of joy and they are full of thanksgiving for those who took the time and sacrificed of their own selves to save and rescue them when they couldn't save themselves. Our response to God should be the same of extreme gratitude. Lord, I couldn't save myself. There's nothing I can do. Thank you, God, for making provision for me because it was impossible for me to do it on my own. The gospel is offensive because it tells us we cannot save ourselves. Notice back in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15. We find that the gospel is offensive. It's a stumbling block. It's an offense. Because it is exclusive in its remedy for sin. Oh, the world hates this one. It's so offensive. Notice what it says in verse 3. Christ died for our sins. To to our human minds, exclusiveness is often offensive because it means, here's what it means. Some people are right and some people are wrong. We hate that because everybody's right today. Everybody wins. Everybody gets a prize just for playing, right? There's no no first place. Everybody's, 
You know, no, it, if exclusiveness is offensive. It means people are right and some are wrong. If, if you see a sign that says one way as you're driving down the street, then the fact of the matter is this. Here's the fact. If you go the opposite way, you are going in the wrong direction. That's the fact. The issue is black and white. It really is. No matter how much one may try and rationalize it. Well, no, to me or to people that I care about, it really isn't one way. It's okay to turn around and go the other way on the one way street. We don't like to be told that we're wrong. And, and I hope if you're like me, you don't like to have to tell other people that they're wrong either. Now, I know some of you probably do. I know there, there are people out there who love to tell other people they're wrong. We'll get to that maybe later at another point. There's an issue there. Okay. You shouldn't. Um, I don't like to tell other people they're wrong. I really don't. It's not something I like to have to do. But the very God who created us has set spiritual laws in place that only he can declare and enforce. I can't change the rules. I can't change God's rules. I, I can't say, well, Lord, I know that for me, Jesus Christ is the way exclusively, but, but for those across the world, no, there, there are other ways. When he makes it very clear, we're all under sin and he is the way, the truth. And like Christ died for our sins. The most important law is that spiritual life can only come to those who receive the free gift of eternal life through faith alone in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I just, I just quoted John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man, not, well, just Jews or just Gentiles or just Chinese people or just Americans or no man cometh unto the Father, unto God the Father, but by me, but through me. What I've done, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the son of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Acts chapter four. I mean, the, the early uh, apostles understood this in Acts chapter four and verse 10, where, uh, you know, Peter is, is preaching and he says, be it known unto you all to all the people of Israel that by the name, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, there's the gospel the, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Oh, by the way, neither is there salvation in any other. You mean I can't do it myself? No. You mean another God can't do it? No. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, he, here's the fact, and, and you have to get this. I, I, I've, I've had to learn this. People can disagree with the exclusivity of the gospel. They can disagree with it all they want. But their disagreement does not negate its factual and spiritual reality. Several years ago at our, at our camp, our fall retreat, we had shirts, t-shirts, and we put on the back, truth exists. Remember John 14, 6. And I wanted to add more to that. I wanted to add to the back, truth exists, whether you choose to believe it or not. And then I felt, eh, see, that's a little bit more of the, maybe too rough. But the fact of the matter is exclusivity of the gospel and the truth exists. Just because you don't believe it doesn't make it any less true. And we have to grasp that in today's culture where everybody in our relativistic postmodern culture says, well, it's going to be true for you, but it's not true for me, or I don't have to believe this. Or I think there are many paths to God, many ways to God. And you could say, okay, you have a right to believe that, but it doesn't mean you're right. In fact, you're, you're wrong. And here's what the Bible has to say about that. The gospel is offensive because it's exclusive in its remedy for sin. Next, we find back in 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is offensive because it, it, this is hard. This is really hard for some of us. It demands that we take the word of another. 
Notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what Paul writes in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. See that? Again, I think pride seems to be the basis for the offense and stumbling block of the gospel here. Uh, And of course, that only makes sense because the Bible tells us pride is the real root of all offense. Only by pride cometh offense. But as sinful people, here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make here. We don't like others to tell us what to do or what to believe. I don't like you to tell me what to do. Don't you tell me what to believe. I'm not going to take your word for it. No way. I know who I am. I'm an American. I'm a 21st century American. I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I'm working hard and I'm doing everything I need to do to save myself. And you don't tell me I can do what I want. And I'm going to, you know, this is the attitude we have today. We don't like to be told what to do, what to believe. We want to go our own way. And in God's eyes, that's pure rebellion. For while we must not listen to the advice or the commands of those who are not advancing the truth, close your ears to that, we must always take the word and heed the counsel of those who are advancing the truth. And of course, God is truth. Therefore, to take his word is the best thing we can do. I'm not going to turn there because we're running out of time, but jot down and notice Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, it's very clear. Hebrews 2, 1, 2, 3, 4 is very clear. We have to take God at his word and apply that word to our lives for our own good. We must. We must. John chapter 1, the the beginning of the gospel of John, reminds us that we're not just taking the word of another fallible person when we take God at his word. The very God himself who dwelt among men to give himself a ransom for all, it's his word and his work and his person that my eternal well-being is resting on. I'm taking the word of another. Oh, it's offensive to to us today, I think especially American Western culture, Americans, it's so offensive to us to take the word of another. The gospel is offensive because it demands we take the word of another. It's offensive because it's exclusive and it's remedy for sin. It's offensive because it tells us we can't save ourselves. It's offensive because it tells us we're broken. We all are. Nobody is unbroken. Oh, nobody is. It can get past this. Next, the gospel is offensive because it demands the lordship of Jesus Christ. Notice verse, again, verse 3, Christ died for our sins. Again, the seeming offense here comes as a result of our selfish pride. We don't want to be a servant to anyone naturally. Although, here's what we fail to realize We are often slaves to our own flesh. We don't think about that. The Bible puts it this way. We are slaves to our own flesh when we're walking in carnality. Oh, but we're so proud. I'm I'm, I'm not a servant to anybody. Nobody's my Lord. Nobody's over me. And yet the gospel is offensive. It demands the lordship of Christ. Christ died for our sins. Now, careful here. You know me, those of you who who are here at Grace Bible Church for a while. The gospel is not that we must do works and give up works in order to be saved. Careful. Yet the one who believes the gospel and the one who becomes a child of God has a new master, whether or not he or she really fully understands it. They do. I I remember one of my seminary professors, it was so great. He was talking about the errors and dangers of lordship salvation. And he said, you know what? Christ is Lord, whether you accept it or not. He's the Lord. Well, we could look at many texts of scripture where believers are described as servants of the Lord. So many times Paul describes himself as a servant, a bond slave, a doulos, a servant of Jesus Christ. We could really go to Luke chapter 14, where we discover if we are the kind of disciples that we ought to be, Jesus will have priority over family, priority over our own selves, and priority over our things or possessions. 
Friends, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life today? Yes. Are you allowing him? Here's the question. Are you allowing him? The gospel is offensive. It demands the lordship of Jesus Christ. Next, the gospel is offensive because it can be embraced. We, here's something else. It can be embraced and propagated by anyone, regardless of color, social status, economic status, or whatever else. Notice again, verse 15, chapter 15, Christ, verse 3, died for our sins. The gospel puts every person on equal ground. It doesn't matter what color you are, what background you have, how much money you have or do not have. It doesn't matter. And while I can stand up here and say, thank the Lord for that, that's very offensive to many people in the world. For one man to be equally guilty and to equally receive forgiveness of sins as any other man or woman does not coincide with man's sinfully inherent belief that he's better than somebody else in some way, shape, or form. Yet God declares the equality of all people in several ways. You ever think about this? I don't have the time to go through this this morning in detail, but God declares the equality of men in several ways. You know what he declares all? When I say men, I'm saying mankind. Men, women, rich, poor, doesn't matter the color, the status, class. God declares all are equally guilty. We already saw that. All. God declares that he is God over all. Romans chapter 3. He's he's God over all. He declares that all can be saved. God declares that all can be saved. John 3.16, Romans 5.18. I love the fact that we can go to anybody in the world and say, Jesus Christ died for you and for your sin. We don't believe we can go to some. I don't know. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can tell this person. I don't know if they're elect or not. I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. I don't want to try to encourage you to trust in the Lord if you're not chosen. We can go to anybody in the world and say, Jesus died for your sin and loves you. He paid the price for your sin. Will you receive his free gift of eternal life today through believing in him alone for your eternal salvation? He declares that all are equally, we're all on equal ground. We're all equal guilty. He, he's God over all. All can be saved. He declares that all must be saved and all need to be saved. Acts 17, 30. I, I, I love Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And we've been through Acts before, but the name of this, the times of this ignorance God winked at, he overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere. He declares all must be saved, all need this, and he declares that in 1 Timothy 2, 4, God desires all would be saved. God wants who would have all men to be saved. He desires God paid the penalty for the sins of the world, not just some. Unlike many of the religions of the world that are rooted in either a type of caste system or, or works, Based upon your ability, Christianity puts all people everywhere on a level playing field. That's offensive to a lot of people because I think I'm better than you. I have more money than you. I'm a better color than you. I came from a better family than you. I'm from a better country than you. Whatever. This is, this is our sinful, proud nature that we have. And finally... The gospel is offensive because it's not something we could think up ourselves. Our text again, Christ died. He was buried. He rose again. Are you ready for the next phrase that keeps showing up? According to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. We're too stupid I'm sorry. I know I'm going to, the young people don't use that word. Okay. Kids, you're not supposed to use the word stupid. Okay. But we are too, let me put it this way, unoriginal. And yet we think we're so wise and we're so smart and we're so clever and we're so advanced and we can figure out anything, man. Um, 
First Corinthians chapter one, we just, I don't have the time to go back and read it, but God has chosen the weak things of the world, the base things to confound the mighty and the wise. Galatians chapter one, I, I, I turn here because the apostle Paul says in verses 11 and 12 of Galatians one, I, I certify you brother and I, the gospel which was preached of me, notice what Paul says, it's not after man. Notice, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This wasn't something that man came up with and, and, and he figured out or he put together. The uniqueness of the gospel in the sense of its origin is so important. It's not from man's mind, but received directly from God. Listen, I, we're out of time to talk about the right way to share. We'll get there. Okay, another time. But the gospel is offensive. Paul says it's a stumbling block and an offense. It's offensive because it tells us that we're broken. It's offensive because it tells us we can't save ourselves. It's offensive because it's exclusive in its remedy for sin. It's offensive because it demands we take the word of another. It's offensive because it demands the lordship of Christ. It's offensive because it can be embraced and propagated by anybody and everybody, regardless of their status or condition. It's offensive because it's not something we could think up and come up with on our own. Listen, pride Pride is the ultimate barrier to receiving the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Pride. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today and you're sitting here at Grace Bible Church of Fresno or you're watching or listening later by way of recorded media, check your pride at the door and realize you're a sinner who needs a Savior. And, and, and I, maybe there's some here this morning who have kind of just gone through motions and, and your pride is standing in the way of you be, uh, receiving the free gift of eternal life through faith alone now because what are people going to think? I've, I've, been, I've been showing and acting like I've trusted him as my savior all along. Check your pride at the door now. Place your trust for your eternal well-being in Jesus Christ and what he's already done for you, your eternity depends on it. It does. Your eternity depends on it. If you do know Jesus Christ as your savior today, understand it does no good to sugarcoat or water down, really, the truth of the gospel, because to do so actually changes the truth and the depth of something so incredible and amazing as the good news. We need to realize the gospel is offensive. That's what I've tried to share this morning, even here from 1 Corinthians 15. It is offensive, but at the same time, we can use its offensiveness, if you will, to level the playing field, letting others know it's totally non-discriminatory. It is. We need to let people know the gospel is universal in its scope. And I think that approach allows us to speak the truth in love and grace and allow the Holy Spirit to work in the heart and the life of the unbeliever. Because we can't do it. We don't save anybody. It's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit with the seed of God's word that we've planted. We need to make sure then as we share the truth, the listener knows that we're genuine and sincere in our love and concern for them. Oh, man. The church today has really, really messed this up. Because we have programs and we have... We have, you know, special ways that we have it so it's so slick they have to say yes and we can trick them into saying yes. And no, no, no. Make sure the listener knows that you're genuine and sincere in your love and concern for them. And, and, and lastly, show your love and concern through not only your belief, but your behavior. Man, thank the Lord for the good news that we're going to celebrate and remember this morning. The shed blood and broken body of Jesus Christ. For us, I challenge you this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the day. God says, behold, now is the day of salvation. Trust him alone. Not anything you could do or think you can do. Check the pride at the door and realize I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. And the only way I can receive this free gift of eternal life is through faith alone in the personal work of Jesus Christ, my Lord. For by grace, that's unmerited favor, you're saved. 
not of works, lest any man should boast. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time you've given us this morning to consider the truth of your word and the, the power of the gospel, the good news. I pray you would help us who do know you and have believed this gospel to the saving of our souls to, to show that we love others by declaring it in truth and love. I pray if there's anyone here this morning who has not placed their faith, their trust in the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ, today will be the day they do this. Lord, thank you for the time we can come and consider this together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's interesting.